Hello, and welcome to episode 114 of Killer Hangover. My name is Beth. I'm Bettina. And it's been a while since we've done this. I feel a little <laughs> rusty, quite honestly. I feel I feel very rusty, honestly. Uh, I think I asked time. you 10 times what episode this was. <laughs> oh, I've missed you, and I actually didn't talk to you at all today, which is very rare. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> and I just remembered I had something I wanted to ask you if you've seen in the news, and it's kind of relevant to the podcast. Have you seen this Geico situation? Yeah. Okay. So for our listeners, in case you haven't seen this, but this woman is suing Geico <laughs> because she had adult relations with a man <laughs> in his car. And picked up HPV. So she's suing Geico. his car insurance <laughs> because they had their adulty relations in his car. And Geico's going, that's not covered. <laughs> they said, well, that's not like normal use of a vehicle. But uh, the, as of right now, they owe her $5.2 million. It's crazy. That's got to be thrown out. I mean, that's just read. Ridiculous. The Missouri courts did not approve the appeal. She is getting it. It's. Oh. It looks like it's going to go to trial. Well, I'm sorry, but it's really her fault. She wasn't using protection, okay? Or he wasn't. He had throat cancer. He knew he had HPV, and he did not share that with his partner. Yes, but she's suing his auto company. I mean, I, the whole thing doesn't make sense to me. Well, it's just like if you get into a car accident, if she were to get in the car accident, she would go. I mean, that's what the auto insurance is for. But if she was just in like, the car during the crash, yes. And she was in the car and there's medical bills involved. So, I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, the lawyer that came up with this, kudos to them. Like a brilliant, honestly, so creative and like. Where where's it going to go next? Like if somebody picks up an STD, are we going to go after people's home insurances now? Like this is crazy. You're going to see a lot crazy. of changes in a lot of insurances now because of this. Totally. I think it's totally stupid. Yeah, whatever. Let's just sue everybody we can. Yeah, anyway, well, <laughs> I think it's creative. And I was just blown away with just how crazy it is. But really, it made I, me it made me mad. So <laughs> why? Well, take responsibility. I'm sorry. I mean, he's got to take responsibility. Yes. So sue him. Why his car insurance? I mean, it just, to me, it makes no sense. And yeah, it's some lawyer wanting to make a big buck, I guess. But anyway, let's move on. <laughs> wow, mom's getting heated about this. Okay, so yes, let's move on then. And what are you drinking? Okay, I had to do something with tomato juice. I had to. Had to. Had to. Had to. And you'll know why. But we had no tomato juice, of course. So <laughs> Tom got Zing Zang. And I said, that's cool. We can use that too. So I use Zing Zang, but it's not a Bloody Mary. Because instead of vodka, I used mezcal tequila. Oh, mezcal again. Mezcal Still again. Still have not tried this. So I did three ounces of Zing Zang. One ounce of mezcal, ice, and a squeeze of lime. And it is very good. I can imagine. It's very good. I think mezcal, it's you said, than... is like tequila. So, yum. It, but, it, but it's smoky. So, extra yum. Mm. It's very good. I tried making one also with rum. Ew. That was also a suggestion I found on the web. Ew, that does not sound good at all. It's actually not bad. It's sweeter than this is. And I like the smokiness of the mezcal. It fits perfectly with the Zing Zang. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> What's the name of the cocktail? And you can't tell us why you did this? No, you'll find out. Um, I don't know. Maybe our listeners can name it. <laughs> Basically, I use, I use the back of the Zing Zang bottle. And instead of vodka, I put in mezcal and I just put it in a very small glass so I kind of cut down on the on the recipe what they called for on the bottle okay get all that <laughs> I think <laughs> I am drinking 
peanut butter whiskey. It has nothing to do with my story, but it has everything to do with three toddlers at home. And, and the day you've all had. Of this. <laughs> ah, the week I've had. All of this rain that we're having, Ugh, I'm over it. Definitely. <laughs> thunderstorm after thunderstorm. Annabelle, my dog, is terrified of thunderstorms, so she's crying to get into bed with us, and she is the worst dog to sleep with. She sprawls out. And yes, she is a small dog, but she sprawls out and then she's like a brick and will not. Move. And she snores. And, and she snores so loudly. <laughs> but if you don't pick her up and put her in the bed, she will go from my side to Alex's side crying and scratching and jumping and crying. And it just, it's been bad. It's been the last three nights of Annabelle. <laughs> Annabelle. So yeah, I am drinking. I'm drinking. I'm drinking. <laughs> I'm drinking. Maybe that'll help me sleep tonight. I'm also drinking because this true crime story. Oh, I should have made a bigger glass then. Yeah, you should have. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> the post warning. I have been researching this uh, for a long time. I have found so many podcasts on this and there's several that have done like specifically like several episodes of specifically this crime. Uh -huh. Murder Sheet and Red Ball with Ashley Flowers are the two that really like dove deep and gave several episodes into this. And it has been told on other podcasts, many other podcasts. And for the sake of the victims and their families, it is a story that needs to be told time and time again. It's an interesting case. And just so that you don't get your hopes up, it is a cold case. It is unsolved. Mm. hopefully answers will be found but with this one I just don't know I really don't know I will be covering the Burger Chef murders in Speedway Indiana this week are you ready yes I am I think I might know this case anyway go ahead please in 1978 four employees of the Burger Chef restaurant go missing and two days later are found brutally murdered 20 miles away the facts and details of this case are, well, they're gruesome, heartbreaking, and will leave you asking many questions. First, what is Burger Chef? Do you know what Burger Chef is? A restaurant <laughs> that, serves, oh! that serves burgers. <laughs> oh! You're a clever one. I know. It was a fast food burger place. They first opened in the 1950s. And actually, they were the second largest burger chain in the 60s. Honestly, a lot of McDonald's ideas came from poor old Burger Chef. Oh. Like McDonald's has their characters, you know, Ronald McDonald and that purple right. thing. I think his name is Grimace. And they have the Hamburglar and Birdie and the Early Bird and all that kind of stuff. Well, Burger Chef was first and they had Burger Chef and Jeff. <laughs> okay. This chef and this little kid named Jeff. And they had adventures together. There was also characters Fan Burger, Burgerella, and Keckleburger. Burgerella? Oh, I liked Keckleburger. She was a witch. <laughs> Burger Chef had a fun meal, which was the kid's meal, in a cardboard box with riddles and puzzles and a small toy. And then later, McDonald's introduced their... Happy Meal. I was going to say, that sounds familiar. Definitely. Burger Chef sued. Oh, whoa, another suing here. <laughs> That's where it correlates. Okay. <laughs> and this one's just as crazy because Burger Chef sued McDonald's for taking all of their ideas and they lost. <gasps> Burger Chef went bankrupt and closed down. In 1982, the remaining locations were all purchased by Hardee's. And I guess occasionally Hardee's will bring back the Big Chef Burgers, and some of their old locations. Oh. But this just, like, bothered me. Yeah. It's the Big Chef Burgers, and it's spelled S-H-E-F. Okay. Not like chef. But the but the restaurant was Burger Chef. C-H-E-F. C -H -E -F. Right. So why would you name your burgers S-H-E-F? That just doesn't make <laughs> any sense to me. And it actually really bothers me for some reason. <laughs> That's why they went out of business. Anyway, so... That's the scene, a Burger Chef restaurant in 1978. The restaurant was located at 5725 Crawfordsville Road in Speedway, Indiana. Crawfordsville Road was a main road in the area. 
Next door was a busy Dunkin' Donuts, and across the street was a very busy strip mall with a nightclub in it called The Galaxy. Mm. I will introduce you to the Burger Chef employees next, who were working that fateful November evening. Ruth Shelton, she was 17. She was an honor student who was already setting up classes for the future with goals of pursuing a double major in business and math. She wanted to work in computer sciences and put a lot of focus in STEM-related classes at school. Wow, in 1978? Yes. Wow. A female doing that, yes. She was ahead of her time. She was creative. Her sister shared a story on the Murder Sheet podcast when they were younger. Apparently, Ruth had gone outside and asked a city employer that was out there working on the telephone lines if she could have some wire. He cut her some and she took the wire inside and she made different rings. So she had the different colors of the wires. She tore it apart. She made all these different rings and she bent the wires to make like flowers on the rings. And her little sister was just in awe of Ruth, how creative she was, and how brave she was to go outside and ask a stranger (laughs) for some wire. Ruth was very religious and was a big part of the youth ministry at her church. She wrote regularly in her diary, and this was really sad for me, but one of the inserts was after Christmas, and she listed all of her Christmas gifts that she got that year. But she ended the diary entry with stating that the best thing she received that Christmas was the realization of how much she loved her mom and dad. Oh. Mark Flemons. He was 16, and he was the youngest of seven brothers and sisters. His parents were devout Jehovah Witnesses. Mark and his family had just moved to the area a little less than a year before the abduction. He had some trouble adjusting to high school. I mean, it was his first year of high school. That's a hard transition, I think, for any kid. But he transferred in the middle of the school year. So that makes it harder. Yes. And the other obstacle was that he was black in a predominantly white area of Indiana. And... The area was known for having some pretty vocal racists in the community at the time. I remember it was 1978. Uh, But Mark was described as very nice. He was funny, and he was known to be quite the joker. Even though it was a hard adjustment in the beginning, he was really just starting to break through his shell and find his own Mm -hmm. in Speedway. Danny Davis. He was also 16 and was known to be more reserved and quiet. He was newer to working at Burger Chef than the others. Some resources said that he had only just started the week before. Oh, geez. Danny's passion was photography. He loved taking photos and working with cameras. He even created his own dark room in his house. Wow. He was also very interested in aviation and planned on joining the Air Force right after high school. Jane Freet. She was the assistant manager. She was 20 years old and had transferred to this Burger Chef location just that year. She started working at Burger Chef when she was 17 years old. Her friend Charlie was interviewed on the Murder Sheet podcast, which I highly recommend. It goes into depth and interviews close family and friends, and it's it's a very good podcast. The one thing that Charlie remembered most was her very sparkly braces because she always smiled so big. Oh, She was kind of a tomboy, but was also very beautiful. She was very active in school growing up. The pep club, gymnastics, was the library assistant, and also worked at Burger Chef part-time as well. She seemed, from a lot of resources I read, to have been a very well-rounded young lady. But from the Murder Sheet podcast, there was some suspicion, and not just the Murder Sheet podcast, but in general, there was some suspicion that there was something going on behind the scenes, maybe. Charlie mentioned that on the afternoon of the abduction, before she went to work, she came to his house and she seemed a bit off. He asked her if everything was okay and she said nothing was wrong. But Charlie felt something was off. I mean, so much so that he even called her at the restaurant that night Mm -hmm. just to check up on her and make sure she was okay. Again, this is an unsolved case. Charlie could be reaching and searching all angles for an answer, reading into little things just to try 
to get resolution for himself and the others that loved Jane. <sighs> okay, now, big gulp, and I'll share the story. That was a big gulp. I heard it. <laughs> it was, sorry. <laughs> a young high school student, Ginger, got asked to go on a date with her boyfriend, Brian. The two worked at Burger Chef together, and Ginger was set to work that Friday night. So she set out to find someone to work for her. She wasn't having much luck. Brian suggested that she work and he come and they close up together, and then maybe they could squeeze in some time if they worked faster to close up. But that would mean that Ginger would be out probably past curfew. She'd get in trouble. She had to find somebody to cover her shift. Eventually, she talked Mark, the new kid, into taking her closing shift oh. Friday, November 17th. Before their date, Ginger and Brian popped by the burger chef. Mark was working at the front cashier and refused to talk to Ginger in oh. kind of a joking way. Like, ugh, you're making me work on a Friday night. And you're out on a date, right? Smirking as he pretended to ignore her. Then Brian and Ginger left on their date. Ginger, having no idea that her life was saved by not working that shift. Ginger and Brian go on their date. They have a nice evening, but quickly realize they're running late and need to get Ginger home so that she does not miss curfew with her parents. They drive down the main road, Crawfordsville Road, and they see that all the lights are still on at the Burger Chef. They both found that odd since closing was 11 and it was nearly midnight. Hmm. Brian asked Ginger if they should stop and go in and see what was going on, but Ginger was more afraid of her dad at that point, so she had Brian take her home. After dropping her off, Brian headed to Burger Chef to see what the deal was. When he arrives, he sees all the lights are still on, but he doesn't see anyone in the dining room of the restaurant through the large windows. There's one car parked in the parking lot. Danny's, maybe? He walks around the back and finds that the back door is slightly opened. Brian walks in and is surprised when it's silent. There's no one mopping, no one cleaning counters. He walks into the back office where Jane would normally be counting money and closing out at the end of the shift, but mm -hmm. she wasn't there either. No one was in the restaurant. There were coins scattered on the floor in front of the cash register. Oh, no. The safe was open and nothing was inside. Two purses, Jane's and Ruth's, were left hanging, but the four employees' coats were gone. Where were they? He checked the parking lot again. Yeah, Jane's car is gone. But why is her purse still here? He used the restaurant's phone and started calling around to figure out where the assistant manager and the other employees were. Eventually, the Speedway police were called at 1215. Police arrive and, Mom, they don't do anything. What? There's no crime scene investigation done. There's no fingerprints taken. Like, some resources said that a photo was taken. I'll get into that later. But it's assumed that the police believed that the four kids had just taken the money and went out on some joyride. That doesn't even make sense. Crazy teenagers. Jeez. I know. Like, I literally just explained to you these four kids. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't say kids. These young adults. And I don't know. Nothing indicates wildness. Literally, they checked things out, they closed up the restaurant, and they allowed the morning's opening shift of to employees go on. to come in as normal. They mopped, wiped the counters, and opened the oh restaurant. Oh my gosh. Meaning no evidence would or will ever be discovered at the scene of the crime. That's nuts. From the descriptions I gave of the employees and all the information I found in my research, none of them really seemed like teenagers that would just take the $500 from the safe, which is today would have been a couple thousand dollars, and just take off. And mm -hmm. their families called into the police when Jane, Ruth, Danny, and Mark never came home. Around 4.30 a.m., Jane's car, a white Chevy Vega, was discovered. It was parked outside of Leonard Park. Interestingly enough, very nearby to the local Speedway police station. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty close to the Burger Chef. If you would have just taken a right out of the Burger Chef and taken another right and then taken another right, that's where it was parked. Oh. Although the investigation at the Burger Chef restaurant seems botched. Like, remember that one photo I said they took of the crime scene? Mm -hmm. Apparently, it was taken the next day. After everything had been cleaned up and opened for business, officers went back and kind of staged it from memory. No. no and no, took a no. photo. 
Uh. Now, like I said, that was from just one resource. This case has so many different stories. Uh, and that's why I really wanted to listen to Red Ball by Ashley Flowers because she was working with the investigator in that four part series. Oh, wow. OK. And then a murder sheet podcast that, like I said, they're interviewing the witnesses, the friends, the family members. So I'm going to go off of the in-depth podcasts because, I mean, I feel like the witness being interviewed is going to I don't know. I'm just going to go off that. I think you're wise to do that. Instead of speculation, instead of all these other podcasts, maybe be, uh, maybe be, they be, (laughs) maybe they're, (laughs) whoa, (laughs) maybe they're speculating, you know, and we don't, we don't like to do that. So, well, I mean, just the different facts. Well, what I got from like Red Ball was different than what I could get from like the Wikipedia page. So it's definitely, yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, there are many people that are very disappointed that the investigation was taken as it was, not very seriously. And it seems that they really just believed they're being silly teenagers and they took the money and just left. That may be true, but Officer Jim Kramer from the Indiana State Police Force, he went out in search of the four missing employees. He did go in search for them. He searched known party spots, rural fields, and abandoned barns. I mean, he did search. Again, I don't know if the resources are correct that the police just wrote it off and closed up and went home. Like, I do think there was some, obviously, follow through. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the call is made to family members to come down to the station that Sunday. The four had been found in a wooded area 20 miles away from the Burger Chef restaurant. They had all been brutally murdered. Ruth and Danny were laying on the ground next to each other their faces down in the dirt, their arms up to comfort their faces from the earth. It is assumed that they were told to get out of the vehicle and lay on the ground face down. Ruth had pressed her face so deeply into her arms that her glasses were pressed up on her forehead. Because of her strong religious beliefs, I can imagine her praying. Danny and Ruth were shot and killed right there on the ground. Jane and Mark were found in opposite directions away from Ruth, and Danny. Jane had died from stab wounds. She was stabbed twice in the heart with a large hunting knife. The second stab was done with such force that the blade had broken from the handle inside of her. Oh, jeez. Mark's death is the most interesting to me. He was beaten. Very badly beaten. But he didn't die from the beatings. He died from asphyxiation and choking on his own blood. I find that interesting and investigators find that interesting because essentially he was alive when the killer or killers left. Oh, geez. Why risk having a witness being left alive? And I say killers because, I mean, I believe it to be more than one because of the different manners at which they were all killed. Mm -hmm. All brutal, but all so different. And then you have the question, why this location out in Johnson County, 20 miles, it was a 40 minute drive from the restaurant where they were abducted from. Mm. If they were just looking for a rural place or woods or fields, 10 minutes away from the restaurant there would was have been bad. closer, right. Like why go all the way out here to kill them? And then you have to ask the motive. Why? Yes, $500, which I said before is a couple thousand dollars nowadays, was taken from the restaurant. But again, the purses were left. Jewelry and watches and wallets were left on the victims. So oh my gosh, was this a robbery? This case has so many theories, many rabbit holes. There's even been those people that have come forward and claimed that they did it. Of course. I'll cover a few of those stories and theories. But honestly, like, what are you thinking right now? Like, wow, I'm thinking... There's definitely two, if not three. I'm, d- I'm thinking two killers because how three, that would be too many people to sit in the car. So I'm thinking two right. killers um, and the teens and the 20 year the young adults were in the back seat, maybe with a gun put, they pointed at them so they wouldn't do anything. And then they got to this place. But is this place special to these killers? I know. And then, like, why was Jane's car found somewhere else? Oh, 
Well, maybe one of them. No. Maybe they tried taking two cars, thinking that they could keep the, maybe they divided the kids up and then thinking they could control them while they were driving. And that didn't work. And so they stopped the car. <laughs> they all got in the one car. <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, honestly, Mom, every police officer, every detective, every state trooper, everyone that has ever worked this case has a different theory. But most agree on one thing, that this was a burglary. Ah, I said it very nicely. <laughs> gone wrong. So... Like I said, there's many theories. I'm just going to name kind of the top ones that I can see. So apparently there was a fast food restaurant burglar robber. (laughs) Uh, There's a lot of fast food restaurants being robbed in the Indianapolis area. Uh. And if you remember, Jane had transferred to this restaurant from another burger chef. Some believe that maybe she or Mark was new to the area. Maybe Mark. Somebody maybe recognized one of the robbers. And then it just kind of went wrong from there. Um, I, like Mark wasn't supposed to be working that night. So right. maybe he knew Mark. Maybe Mark recognized the robber. Mm. And they were like, shoot, you're not supposed to be here. I, I don't know, because he was beaten. And that seems more personal to me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Being yeah. beaten, it just seems more. And they left him. Like left. Did they think he was dead when they left Maybe him? they did. Yeah. I, I can assume they did. But. But, like, if they were robbing and it went wrong, say that is still it, why drive them so far and kill them so violently? Like, usually in those situations, if you're robbing a place, you'd want to do it quick. Like, even if you got caught, you'd still want to, like, kill them quick and get out and get out of there. You know what I mean? No, right. So why take four people and drive around 20 miles and then kill them so brutally? Doesn't make sense. And that Chevy Vega, Jane's car that was left, it was smaller. If there would have been more than one killer, they're all maybe trying to squeeze into the smaller car. And then because we're talking six people. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it was ditched and they all got into another car. Right. Or did they commit the murders in two separate cars? They took them out there in two separate cars. They committed the murders and then they were trying to drive the car back back to the restaurant but maybe they didn't know where the restaurant was so they got lost and they ended up just parking it there like it is a residential area where the car was found and a woman in the house very near to where the car was left did hear a car door slam and because of the show she was watching they can put a time stamp to that the Mm -hmm. show it was airing between 11 p.m and 1 a.m it was some late night show and so that does fit into a timeline I mean, if the restaurant closes at 11 mm-hmm. and say the burglars came in at closing time. Right. Because remember the kid that was on the date. Right. Uh, Brian was there probably around 1215, remember? And so. Well, he was there at 12-ish because he called the cops. The cops were called at 1215. At 1215. Mm-hmm. Right. So everything happened within that hour? At least taken from the restaurant. That's crazy. And maybe not even then because... Maybe even at a shorter period of time because they drove by the restaurant. I mean, Mm -hmm. maybe it was happening at that time. I don't know. But maybe it happened even before they drove by the restaurant. And like this is something I think about, too, is if these people went in planning to kill the employees, Mm -hmm. the employees were wearing their coats. So it's like, come get in the car, but grab your coat. You might be cold. Yeah, you know, doesn't that seem odd? Like if the killers knew they were going to kill them, why tell them to put on their coat? And if the victims knew that they were about to be killed, why would they go grab their coats? So it's almost like they were picked up and grabbed as they were leaving. But the girls didn't have their purses. Their purses. Right. And all the lights were still on. All of them. All the lights. They were Mm -hmm. leaving the lights, especially in the front room, would have been turned off. Would have been turned off. So that's the other thing that I that question about the robbery is why they leave the lights on. If they turned the lights off, nobody would have known that anything would have happened. Exactly. So this is a cold case. Obviously, there's a lot of unanswered questions, but that doesn't mean that there were never suspects, tips or eyewitnesses. One eyewitness was George. <laughs> Another George. <laughs> hey, George, we missed you. <laughs> Remember I said that there was a Dunkin' Donuts right next to the burger chef. 
And mm-hmm. they're very close to one another. They shared a dumpster area right between them. So that I can set the scene even more, there's a railroad track that runs behind the restaurants. Okay. And then that busy road is right in front of them. Well, George had gone to the Dunkin' Donuts to hang out with his girlfriend who worked there. The two sat in the dumpster area, smoking and drinking. <laughs> yes, she was working. <laughs> Not too many people at Dunkin' Donuts at 11 o'clock, I guess. <laughs> it was around 11.15, and... He knows what time it was because, and this is according to the Red Ball podcast, the investigator was telling Ashley and he like walked her around and she was very surprised at how close the two buildings really were Mm -hmm. because you can pull it up on Google Maps. The building is uh, left abandoned now, the old Burger Chef, and now the Dunkin' Donuts is now, I believe, a tobacco store. Um, But when she, like on Dunk on Dunkin', on Google Maps, it it looks close, but you don't realize how close she was stating. Like, this is like a stone's throw. This is very close, is what Mm -hmm. she was saying. And according to that, the investigator was telling her that they were waiting for her dad or they didn't they didn't know if her dad. I I don't know something about her dad, but they didn't know what time it was. So the couple actually got up from the dumpster area and were going to walk around the burger shaft to see if they could see a clock on the wall in the restaurant. And so they walked around the Burger Chef restaurant Mm -hmm. and they didn't see a clock. All the lights are on. They didn't see a clock. So they went back to the Dunkin Donuts and that's where they saw that it was 1115. And they went back to the dumpster area and continued drinking and smoking or whatever they were doing. So that's how they know what time it was. Where is the this area in reference to the back door of the chef? It's the dumpsters between the two buildings, but it's in the parking lot. But I think closer to the near side of the buildings. Okay, so it wasn't in the back of the buildings. It Correct. was in between the buildings. It's between the buildings. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So they're out there smoking and drinking. It's 1115 and they see two men described as the bearded man and the clean-shaven man (laughs) walking up from the railroad track. The couple put their drinks down so they don't get in trouble. The men walked right up to the couple. The older man, the bearded man, said, You're going to have to leave here. There's been a lot of vandalism going on around here. The couple got up and walked back to the Dunkin' Donuts. She went back to work, and George left. So the descriptions of these men is what the media and what investigators have used the most in this case. There was a sketch made and there were even two busts made. And to this day, no one's ever come forward and said, oh yeah, that was me or anything. So it is assumed that they had something to do with this. But that's weird in itself. I mean, if you're going to, those guys would be potential witnesses. So wouldn't you get rid of them too? I mean, they they walked right up to them. I mean, if they knew that they were going to do something bad in the chef place, then. Right. Right. Why Why wouldn't they get. Why would they show their faces to these potential witnesses? I see what you're saying. That doesn't make sense either. But maybe they just wanted to rob it. Maybe, again, they weren't planning on killing these kids. But even if it was just meant to to be a robbery. But even if you're going to rob someplace, you don't walk up to people that are right by where you're going to rob and say, dude, better get out of here. <laughs> but it's not like they got a really good description, like the bearded man and the shaven man. Like, OK, <laughs> you know, the man, the shaven man could grow a beard and the bearded man could shave his beard. Like, you just don't <laughs> you don't know. Okay. <sighs> and then there was a story from Alan Pruitt. He was a local teen who was out drinking with a buddy. And lots of he drinking was, going on in this story. <laughs> lots of drinking from what a lot of the interviewers were saying on the Murder Sheet podcast. There wasn't much to do in the area. So <laughs> the kids would drink and party. Uh, he gave a deposition in 1981. He was one of the main witnesses after the crime. And in his deposition, Pruitt said... That he and a friend went to the Galaxy, that club that was across the street street, from Burger Chef, around 1030. Actually, he can't remember if they went in or not because he had been drinking. He does remember that at some point, the Dunkin' Donuts across the street became more appealing. Now, remember that girl that went out with George to smoke and drink by the dumpster? Well, Mm -hmm. apparently she was the ex-girlfriend to Pruitt's friend. 
Oh. And okay. so they went in. The friend introduced her to Pruitt and they all started talking. And then Pruitt started feeling sick. So he went outside and he got sick by their car. I will stop here and share that an older gentleman that has no, little to do about nothing or had nothing to do with the situation. I don't know how to say it. He had nothing to do with the situation, but he does confirm that he witnessed two young boys come into the Dunkin' Donuts around 11. They were drunk and one left and got sick by his car. So it does. Okay. It does back up the story that the Pruitt story. came in with his friend. They were chatting. They were drunk and he left to go get sick by his car. Okay. So back to Pruitt's deposition. While he was out there getting sick, he heard a racket next door at the Burger Chef, and he went and peeked at what was going on. He saw a large orange van, maybe a Ford. It had white spokes and curtains with oval-shaped windows. He saw Jeff Reed, a local known criminal in the area. He was known as the King of the Snake Pit, Ew. which back in the day was where the riffraff hung out on the track of the Indianapolis 500. Apparently, it's the place in the infield where, well, let's just say a lot of X-rated things went down <laughs> in view from the rest of the track. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Families are there watching the track, watching the race, and the snake pit was kind of known as, like, there's things going on down there. People weren't really happy about it, but he was the king of the snake pit. They would do sex in the open. There was drugs and it was riffraff. So Pruitt sees Jeff Reed, the known criminal, and he's coming out of Burger Chef with a black boy, Mark. Right. He was being rough with the kid and threw him into the van, beating him up. And the oh. boy was knocked unconscious when he hit his head on the van. Now, remember, Mark was the victim who asphyxiated and was found beat up. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Pruitt then saw Tim Willoughby, Jane, and another girl pulling out of the Burger Chef in Jane's car. Okay, so Tim Willoughby, stop me if all these names get confusing, because I know it's a lot of names, but Tim Willoughby was another local known to get in trouble with the law a lot. I don't want to confuse you, so I'm going to do my best at sharing Tim Willoughby's story. I, I just, I'm going to do my best not to confuse you, but he was in a drug ring. And apparently, so was Jane. Jane? She was selling cocaine for Tim Willoughby. Or with Tim Willoughby, she had something to do with it. Was that proven to be right? I don't know. Oh. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever proved that. But essentially, they were in this drug ring together. Jane apparently owed Tim money and had for a while. And the story that Pruitt shared was that that was what was being said around town. And Pruitt's not the only person to say that Jane owed money for this drug ring. Oh, okay. And that almost adds up to her friend's story where she came over and something before her shift and something was just a bit off. Mm -hmm. So maybe there really was something off. Maybe she really did owe money and it was just starting to catch up with her. But I digress. Willoughby wasn't really a good guy. He was dating a girl named Marianne, and the couple had many domestic disputes. Pruitt's story, his deposition, goes on that he was very drunk that night, but he was sure what he saw. Jeff Reed and Tim Willoughby. The young black boy was being beaten up, and he was thrown into the van, and the others drove away in Jane's car. His story doesn't end there, though. The next day, Pruitt runs into Tim Willoughby, Marianne, and Jeff Reed at Dairy Queen. Tim Willoughby was going out of his way to be very nice to Pruitt and offered him a joint and to go drive around with them. In the car, Marianne was in hysterics, crying. She was very upset and was saying some things that just didn't make sense to Pruitt at the time. Something about how Tim wanted her to shoot someone so that she wouldn't and couldn't tell on him to the police. She started crying about how things weren't supposed to happen the way they did, how Tim just went to Burger Chef to rough up Jane, but that young black boy got involved trying to protect Jane and he got knocked out. And then there were too many eyewitnesses, so they all had to go. Pruitt noticed a 38 or a 32 in the cup holder in the front seat. He knew he was in danger. They were out in the country now, uh. parked, and all of a sudden 
he heard Marianne yell, Alan, get the hell away from here. And he ran. He ran through the woods. He ran and ran and ran until he reached the highway. He kept an eye out for the orange van as he hitched hike back into town. That was the last time he ever saw Marianne. Oh, and actually, no. Marianne has been missing until years later when a young boy discovered a barrel welded shut with a young woman's body inside. And yes, Tim Willoughby was a welder. And Tim Willoughby has never been found. No one knows where he is. Oh, geez. Maybe he's dead, too. Someone claimed that he had been killed by others in the drug ring. A woman came forward and said that her husband had killed Tim Willoughby and Marianne six months before the Burger Chef murders even occurred. That doesn't make sense. Jeff Reed died in 2012, and Tim Willoughby is still missing to this day. And Alan Pruitt came forward and said that his story was mostly untrue. What? He was very drunk that night, and he can't be sure what or if he ever saw anything. His lines are blurred, and he doesn't think his own story is true. Uh, or was he threatened? To this day, Al, he was interviewed on the Murder Sheet podcast, and he says, no, that story wasn't true. Hmm. So he made the whole thing up, even driving around with them? Apparently. And then we have Donald Forrester, a rapist and sex offender, a horrible human being, in my opinion, who claimed he had something to do with the Burger Chef murders. In fact, he had many connections to the area. His cousin lived in the hotel across the street from the Burger Chef, and he had robbed at least one other Burger Chef for sure. Mm. His name was first given on the tip line the police set up after the crime occurred. And I don't know if it just wasn't taken serious or not, but he wasn't really looked into until a while later when he was already in prison for stalking and raping a woman. Again, he's a horrible human being. He was in jail for molesting his sister. It was, he was just a bad guy. But while in prison for the stalking and the raping of this woman, he admitted to knowing and being a part of the Burger Chef murders. So they worked on transferring him down to the area because he was being held elsewhere. Mm -hmm. On the drive from where he was to where they needed him to be, they decided to ask him if he could take them to where the crime occurred. This has never been released to the public. Okay. And he took them to the exact spot. He did? He also took them to the spot where Jane's car had been left. Oh, my God. He knew a lot of facts. Another thing that was odd was his wife shared this story with police that one day they had gone out to this random creek in the middle of nowhere, and he got out, and he went and he collected shells, like from a gun, not seashells. <laughs> <laughs> And he took the shells home and he flushed them down the toilet. Interestingly enough, this house, this is, this is all happening years after the murders happened, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this house wasn't hooked up to the sewer. It had its own septic tank. So police get a warrant and they go and they dig through <laughs> to find shells <laughs> uh -huh. to see if they attach to the crime. And wouldn't you know it, they find three shells. Wow. Two were from a 22 that did not match the gun that was used. The deaths occurred by a 38. And the other shell found may have been a 38, but it was very degraded, so they didn't know for sure. Oh, darn. They needed hard evidence to convict him. Sure. And they asked him, like, we need hard evidence. Give us something. His story was similar to Pruitt's in that Jane was the one that they were after. She was a part of a drug ring and owed money. They'd gone to get her, and Mark had tried to play hero and was beaten and bound in the van. Then the others were grabbed, too, because they couldn't have witnesses. He said they drove out to the woods. He popped a few Demerol and then stooped low to where Ruth was lying on the ground and shot her in the face. He then stabbed Jane low, down low, with a hunting knife. Wait. As you know and I know, this is not true. No. This is a lie. Ruth, like Danny, was shot in the back of the head. Right. And Jane was stabbed. In the heart. Yes. Twice in the heart. It was assumed Forrester was fed. That during an interview, he was fed. Oh. 
Darn it. In the room during an interview, I guess, they had maps and some information of the investigation on the walls. And the questioning was very leading. So he could answer the way they needed him to. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was poor policemanship. I'm not saying it was done purposefully. It could have been done on accident. Like an example they gave in the Murder Sheet podcast. Did you shoot her? Yes. How many times did you shoot her? Once. So who shot her the second time? This leads him to know that the victim was, in fact, shot Shot twice. twice. Right. Forrester wrote out this long statement on how he was the killer. He implicated himself. The next day, he stated that he had made the whole thing up. Yeah. I think he proved that with uh, how he killed them. I know we all want answers. All of the investigators wanted answers. But it was as if they were making the facts fit the scenario that they wanted. State Trooper Kramer did the interviewing of Forrester, and he was convinced the man was lying from the beginning. Forrester was led back into his cell, but before he left, he stated, If you send me back to prison, you will never solve this. And the case to this day has never been solved. I think it's interesting that both Pruitt and Forrester claim Jane owed money Mm -hmm. or was in this underground drug ring. Right. And what makes this even more interesting is years after her murder, her brother was in fact arrested for being a part of a drug ring and selling cocaine. So my question was, did she have any involvement or was she taken as a threat to her brother? To her brother, right. Four trees were planted for the victims at Leonard Park in Speedway, Indiana on the 40th anniversary. This case makes me so mad because I, I don't know how we will get answers. Maybe someone can come forward and I know we have advancements in DNA, but everything's been cleaned. I don't know how you yeah. even no, where there, you even search for there's DNA. There's no evidence. No bagged evidence. No evidence. The knife blade was broken off inside Jane, but the handle was never discovered. And on the 40th anniversary, the investigators released something new to the public, and it was a picture of the hunting knife blade that was inside of Jane. And it's a very unique, ornate blade. And so they're hoping... This is a big knife. And it's something that would be held in a sheath on somebody's hip. You know, it's a known big knife so it's like if you know somebody who was carrying around this beautiful big ornate knife and then all of a sudden didn't have it anymore Mm -hmm. you need to come forward like this is and yes not all information has been released to the public yet but they need to hold on to as much as they can so that they know when the truth does come forward to them that it is the truth because you have people like Forrester and you have people like Alan Pruitt you just don't you just don't know wow there are so many questions I leave this case with, but I just I just don't know if we'll ever get the correct, truthful answers. Yeah. I mean, you would think Pruitt, you'd think his story was right on, and then he pulls it all back, retracts it all. It just is, doesn't make sense. And that woman that came forward and said that her husband killed Marianne yeah. and Pruitt, her husband was arrested. So we don't know. It's very sad. Yeah. And that's four souls that have no answers. And for Jane, like, I hate that now people are saying she was part of this drug ring. Like, if she was, she was, you know. But if she wasn't, like, this is terrible that people are saying this. And there's a lot of people going around at the time, you know, saying, well, they got what they deserved. If you mess with drugs, this is what happens. So victim blaming. Yeah. Like, uh, I believe it was Ruth's sister said that in high school, in school, the following day, say at the counselors and everything, you know, say, you know, they all sat down with everybody. It was like, you know, share your feelings and everything. But one of the girls in her class was like, well, my mom said that if you mess with drugs, this is what happens. Jeez. It's, it's sad. It's really sad. It is sad. Oh, thanks. That was just delightful. (laughs) Oh, I try mom. I try. So many questions. So many questions. Jeez. Yeah. So like I said, the Murder Sheet podcast is a really good. Uh, it's their, They've done a lot of different murders since the Burger Chef. Burger Chef was the first case that they covered. I highly recommend them. They do fast food restaurant murders. Interesting. So they have a niche. It was really good. The male is a lawyer who's actually for Ruth. It was one of Ruth's, the victim's mm-hmm. attorney's. 
And then the female in the podcast, I'm drawing a blank on their names right now because it's late and I've had way too much peanut butter whiskey. She was a journalist. So it was it was a really very well done. And they don't have ants. They they do they have any ideas? I mean, theories, theories, all theories. And it was it was very sad just how Ruth's sister was talking about the funeral and how the mom just she's like, I'll never get that vision out of my head when my mom just draped her body over my sister's casket. No parent should ever have to bury their child. And it was it was very heart wrenching. And then to bury them on top of that, to bury them without answers. With the unknown. Oh, oh, that's just heart wrenching. Okay. Well, are you ready for mine? (sighs) I guess, Mom. Move on, move on. Well, we're going to French Lick, Indiana. French Lick. Okay. It's like a French kiss. (laughs) I knew you would say that. You know, there was absolutely positively no doubt in my mind that you would say that (laughs) (laughs) but like why is it named french lick well specifically we're going to the french lick resort why would you okay it's named actually after the town which it sits on the outskirts of which its name is french French lick (laughs) yes so it's named after the town weird name i know But boy, does it offer an amazing experience in relaxation as well as hauntings. French Lick does or the resort does? The resort. (laughs) The resort. Um, We're talking about the resort. I don't think a French Lick would be very relaxing. but Now, I don't know how you can put haunting and relaxing together. Maybe you can, but I don't think I could put Mm. those two together. I don't think I'd relax. I'd be like, cool, okay, let's experience this, but I wouldn't be relaxing. That's two very different emotions, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about the French Lick Hotel. It was built in 1845 by Dr. William Bowles. That is an unfortunate last name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's Bowles. B-O-W-L-E-S, Bowles. That's a very unfortunate last <laughs> name. <laughs> the draw he used was the sulfur springs that surfaced in the area. People would come from near and far, some as far as 100 miles away, to partake in the miracle waters of the hotel. Does that remind you of any place? That reminds me of the one that was in Arkansas that you covered. The Crescent Hotel. That's the one I was talking about. Yes. In 1901, Indianapolis Mayor Tom Taggett purchased the hotel and made it bigger and better. He added more rooms to the hotel, added luxurious furnishings and marble and Italian mosaic flooring. He designed two championship golf courses and to expand the miracle waters, get this, he bottled Pluto water from the Mm. Pluto spring. So they had a spring, one of these sulfur springs named the Pluto spring. And so he came, he bottled this, Beth, he bottled this to distribute nationwide it was bottled water okay what what why is this so exciting what year was this 1901 oh this is exciting yes (laughs) put the whiskey down (laughs) i mean i had no idea no that is bottled water was that early on well was it like glass bottles too well it's not plastic (laughs) well i didn't know (laughs) any reason why it was called the pluto springs I have no idea. Sorry. I didn't research that. (laughs) French lick, Pluto. (laughs) Curious. Very curious. So Taggart, he talked to Monon Railroad into laying a special track and running daily trains between Chicago and the front entrance of the hotel. Oh, my gosh. Although he spent a lot of money on the hotel, he also brought electricity and a fresh water system, as well as a trolley line to the town of French Lick. Why they need a fresh water when they have the spring water? Was the spring water not good enough? Or was he bottling all the spring water? <laughs> He's bottling it all. Only so, taking so he needed to get that fresh water into town. <laughs> well, I don't think there's springs in town, I think, because this is outside of town. Mm-hmm. <laughs> After Tom's death in 1929, or some sources say 
1916. <laughs> it's like a 10 year difference there, more than. And geez. I could not find anything. I mean, it's so weird. Anyway, his son <laughs> Thomas took over ownership of the hotel. Now, Thomas ran the hotel for about 17 years, after which he sold it. The property was owned by five different companies over the next 60 years. Did they still bottle the water? I don't think so. I think Tom did. Thomas, the son, did. And then I don't think it was bottled anymore. One of the companies actually was the Sheraton Corporation. Oh. Yeah. Fancy. (laughs) They decided to modernize the hotel by lowering the ceilings. How do you do that? Well, you leave. It's like you can press a button and they. (laughs) Beth. Listen to me. They just built another ceiling? So, yeah. So then there's like crawl spaces between all the floors. But And when they did that, they, well, this is like in the lobby area. So the ceiling was very ornate and it had carvings in the plaster. And, you know, he covered, the, or the co- corporation covered that all up with just. Why would you want to do that? They wanted to modernize the building. That's they, sad. They also. I mean, these people were bottling bottles of water. They should keep their ornate ceilings. They were far more advanced. I know. And on top of that, they covered a number of the marble floors and mosaic tiles in the lobby with black and white linoleum tiles and carpet. Yuck. That's sad, too. (laughs) It's very sad. The next owners, the Cox Hotel Corporation of New York, changed only one thing. The name to French Lick Springs Golf and Tennis Resort. French Lick. They were owned by the Cox. <laughs> I'm sorry. These names. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In 1991, the resort was once again put up for sale. And about five minutes after the bidding began, the resort was sold to Luther James of Kentucky. It's a very normal name. <laughs> Thank God. Luther James. I don't know who bought the resort for $2.6 million. He started restoring the hotel right away, uncovering everything that the Sheraton Corporation had covered. He brought in antique decor. He also upgraded the guest rooms and gave the inside and outside a fresh coat of paint. On the exterior of the building, he planted hundreds of flowers. In 1997, James sold the property for $20 million to a wow. group out of Ohio. They continued the renovations. What was their name? I don't know. Well, I I read it someplace, but I didn't put it down. I'm sorry. (laughs) In 2005, it was sold to Cook Group Incorporated out of Indiana. They finished restoring the hotel to its historical splendor with one addition. In 2006, the French Lick Casino was opened. And became oh. the first land-based casino in Indiana. Because, you know, casinos That's are usually cool. on water. On the water. Mm-hmm. But it's on the springs, so it's kind of <laughs> like on the water. <laughs> <laughs> There's water nearby. <laughs> Do you want and some? Pluto's right there. <laughs> okay. At the same time, the nearby West Baden Springs Hotel... So there was another ho- very luxurious hotel. West Baden? Mm-hmm. Bottom or Baden? Baden. It's it's named after a place, Baden-Baden in Germany, that has... <laughs> that ha- <laughs> that's These names. <laughs> it's actually a place I've been to, okay? And so has- nice they named it twice. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Wies Baden. And they have mineral springs there that people go to. So, you know, the guy... Wanted it to be like that. Baden Baden at French Lick. The Baden Springs Hotel was added to the property, making it a resort complex. Dang. As you can see, the resort has a lot of history and it has become recognized as such. It is a National Historic Landmark, a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark, and is on the National Register of Historic Places. A lot of well known people were guests at the hotel. Al Capone. Al Capone was, of course, in the mob, and the mob was in Chicago, which was really close. So this was actually a hangout for a lot of the mob. That's really cool. I love mob history. Uh, Louis Armstrong, John oh. Barrymore, Greta Garbo, Peyton Manning, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, just to name a few, as well as presidents Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry S. Truman, 
Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. And there a, there is a ton of other famous people that went to this to this place. Peyton Manning would okay, I know nothing about football. I'll just admit that. <laughs> no, you don't. The people he threw to and stuff. <laughs> he would take them for golfing weekends and paid for and paid for all weekend uh for to stay at this place. The people he threw to. Okay. <laughs> I think the people who blocked to that defended so his teammates. That defended you could him. just say <laughs> he didn't invite just the say whole his dang teammates. Team. He didn't invite them. But just team. some teammates. Some teammates that caught balls and that blocked would sound, people. I'm sorry, but just saying some teammates would sound a little better than. <laughs> I'm telling you, I know nothing about football. Okay, okay, that was the history. Now on to the paranormal. I think that because Taggett built this resort up and put so much time, effort, and money and ob- obviously love into this project, it should be no surprise that he has often been seen and smelled. Ew, does he stink? <laughs> <laughs> Many have reported a strong smell of pipe tobacco around the service elevator. There have also been reports of the ghost of Taggett being seen near the service elevator. And strangely enough, it's rumored that he rides the service elevator when the hotel is busy (laughs) or in the middle of the night. Now, I guess he used to do this, okay? He'd ride the service elevator when he owned the property, so that's why they think it's him. There have been several times that the service elevator was in motion, but when it opened, there's no one there. Taggett was known for being quite the character. He loved throwing big parties in the hotel ballroom. And he would often enter the ballroom during these parties riding his horse. (laughs) Wow. Okay. So I guess it shouldn't be much of a surprise that the sound of a horse trotting down the hall has been reported. I was going to (laughs) ask, is a horse seen? That's crazy. Some people say, and this is interesting to me because this was the same report on Fort Riley when I did the Fort Riley hauntings. Some people uh-huh. see the horse, some or a specter of the horse. Some people hear the horse, but no one. But they don't see together. it. So they don't do both. Mm-hmm. And that was just like what happened in Fort Riley, if you remember when I talked about mm-hmm. that. I do. I do. Now, this trotting of the horse down the hall has been reported, <laughs> especially by staff members. Now, staff members seem to see a whole lot. They also claim to hear ghost guests partying in the ballroom they hear disembodied voices and get calls in the middle of the night from empty rooms (laughs) so that's pretty creepy i I love that stuff but not as bad as housekeepers occasionally finding blood stains in the bathroom of this one room and i guess supposedly a jilted bride committed suicide in the bathtub so occasionally when they clean that room they go to the bathtub and supposedly see spots of blood or blood stains i mean i don't even want to know the weird things that house the hotel cleaners find Uh -uh. Uh -uh. guests have reported cold spots shadows phantom footsteps and disembodied disembodied (laughs) (laughs) disembodied from new jersey from indiana not new york (laughs) embodied laughter the spirit of (laughs) charles skaggs an employee who was who was found dead at the bottom of the elevator has been seen hanging around the elevator doors one story that i found interesting was of a couple who asked for help from the nice bellboy that they had seen earlier that day in the lobby they were told that no bellboy was working at the time they supposedly saw him They were later shocked to see hanging on the wall an old photo of the bellboy they had seen in the lobby. I love those stories. I do too. I absolutely love stories like that. I love those stories. Hey, if one's going to undertake some paranormal investigation, you might as well do it in style, right? Is this an ad? The hotel has 443 (laughs) luxurious guest rooms, two spas, three golf courses, fine dining, and a casino. It's family friendly. It offers spas and golf, but also bowling, swimming, biking, shopping, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) (laughs) The West Baden Hotel, which remember is the, 
you know, on the Baden Baden <laughs> from Baden Baden. The hotel that was added to the property is also a luxury hotel. It is known for the eighth wonder of the world in the French lit community. This is what? 135 foot high freestanding dome. I mean, pictures of it are amazing. Just uh, absolutely amazing. Which for five decades was the world's largest free span dome in the world. Wow. It's huge. And it's just gorgeous. The West Baden Hotel is grand, but on a smaller scale than the French Lick. It has 243 guest rooms, and it has more of a European feel because the guy brought his ideas over from Germany. Baden Baden. <laughs> Baden Baden. It's more of a romantic getaway. Not so family friendly. I mean, they are, but not so much. But on the other hand, it's very dog friendly. Don't bring your kids, but please bring your dogs. <laughs> There are, I think, 11 or 12 rooms that are for dogs and their families. Dogs are allowed. Not their families. For the couples that bring Oh, them. yes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> dogs are allowed everywhere on the property, except for the spa and pool area and the dining rooms. But that doesn't mean the pooches get neglected. The hotel offers in-room doggy dining. <laughs> this is gourmet dining. Things like oh my steak, god, this is so a place you'd take OB. steak or chicken a la pooch. That's a six ounce sirloin <laughs> cooked medium rare or six ounces. How much does this cost? I don't know. They didn't list the prices. Oh or six my ounce gosh. chicken breast topped with pumpkin puree and fresh parsley. That is all my snoring brick of a dog needs. There's also a fish din- dinner if you want lower fat content. Um, there's meatloaf, which is ground turkey, red <laughs> rice, peas, and carrots. There's Scooter's Biscuit Du Jour and Bo's Half Pounder, just to name a few items on the doggy menu. Obi would love this place. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. That's ridiculous. <gasps> the initial builder of the Baden Baden or the Baden Hotel, uh, he was a dog lover. All his pictures, he has his dog in it. That's sweet. Have you heard of the movie or the book So Cold the River? Mm-mm. I hadn't either, but it's a horror film. That movie was... I thought it was a book. What? So it's a book, yes. Is it a book or a film? Oh, it's two things. It's no, I have to both, know both things. Okay. The movie was actually filmed at the French Lick Hotel. Okay. And parts of it in the Baden Hotel, but mostly at the French Lick Hotel. Okay, I'm going to end with a little, a little, a little, good Lord. A little, man, now we're going to Italy. I'm going to end. French lick, Baden Baden, <laughs> now a little Italy. I'm going to end with a little trivia. Do you know how tomato juice came to be? Yeah, what the hell? That's right. You needed to have tomato juice. <laughs> I don't know. Did somebody squeeze tomatoes into a glass and say, drink it? <laughs> Pretty close, Beth. <laughs> in 1917, at the French Le Hotel, world-renowned chef Louis Perrine ran out of oranges one morning and couldn't serve orange juice for breakfast. Thinking fast, he noticed he had a lot of tomatoes on hand. So he literally squeezed tomatoes into the glasses and said, drink it. Yep. Oh, that's interesting. I love tomato juice. I love it. Well, now you know where it came from. The idea came from. The French now I know lick. it came from the French Lick. French Lick with Resort. The Pluto Springs. <laughs> I like the idea of him riding his horse in the ballroom. <laughs> I do too. That's actually really funny. Oh. <laughs> well, that was a good way to end. Yes, things, I was Mom, just gonna say for that. For sure. <laughs> I was just gonna say that. All right, kiddo. I guess we're still taking our breaks in between. We are, but Patreon, keep an eye out because next Monday you will be getting a Ghost Adventures. Ah, you know what? Screw it. I'll probably release it much earlier. A Ghost Adventures viewing, rating, raves, and reviews from us <laughs> oh, on Patreon. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I just sent it to you, Mom. Have you watched it yet? Uh-uh. Did you? You didn't get it? Did you? I did. Okay. Girl, you need to go watch it. It's really funny. Okay. It's great. We have a really good time with that. If you haven't joined us on Patreon, 
Go ahead and do that now. <laughs> you can do that in the link in the description of this episode. Go to patreon.com or download the Patreon app and look for us, Killer Hangover Podcast. Mom has some interviews set up. She's going to be doing some fun interviews to be releasing on there. Uh, and we do the Ghost Adventures thing on there. It's it's pretty funny. It's pretty funny. No, let's just say it's we really have a good funny. time. <laughs> not pretty funny. <laughs> You're not selling it, man. Anything else you need to share with the uh, good old listeners, Mom? No, I'm just so thankful for you guys. And I definitely miss releasing episodes and chatting, sharing stories with you guys. Yes. That's for sure. Hey, we might actually get together here next time. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yep. <laughs> next next time. I don't, I don't know what time it is now. Find us on social media, find the resources from this episode and pictures and more on our website, killerhangoverpodcast.com. And there is a link in the description of this episode where you can buy us a drink. I'm going to give a shout out to this week. We had three people buy us a drink. Wow. Thank you. Yes. I want to say thank you to Kimberly Ray. Awesome. She said to take a shot of tequila. I'm not doing that. But I did drink straight peanut butter whiskey. So I hope that counts. I got the shot of tequila in my drink. (laughs) Oh, you did. You did. That's true. So it worked out, Kimberly Ray. Thank you. Steven bought us a drink as well. Thank you very much, Steven. Wow, Obi's getting very excited for Steven. And thank you to Michelle for your cocktail that you bought us. We appreciate it, guys. We really do. We appreciate our Patreon and we appreciate when you guys buy us a drink. That means a lot. I hear Obi breathing. He must be very ready to go outside. He's ready and go to go to bed. outside and get his cookie. Or he got very excited from the puppy meals you were <laughs> from the pup meals you were listing off he's like dang that menu sounds good oh, mom hey. when are we going <laughs> mommy can we go <laughs> i literally hear him breathing <laughs> oh my gosh i just feel the hot breath well this is a good one guys thanks for listening i'll be in my lap right now <laughs> i know 95 pound dog <laughs> cheers mama Cheers. Love you, kid.